Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation podcast, a place to learn about breakthroughs in the science and practice of health, mind body interactions, the microbiome, food, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk to longtime colleague and collaborator at UCLA, Dr. Steve Cole, who is considered the father of a new scientific field called social genomics. Dr. Cole is a professor of medicine and psychiatry in the UCLA School of Medicine, where he studies the molecular pathways by which social environments influence gene expression by viral, cancer, and immune cell genomes. His research has mapped the pathways by which social factors enhance replication of viruses, alter expression of key immune response genes, and upregulate cancer progression and metastasis. He has developed an array of new bioinformatics tools to facilitate these analyses and has authored more than 200 scientific publications in high-impact journals. Dr. Cole received his PhD in psychology from Stanford University in 1993 and subsequently completed a postdoctoral fellowship in psychoneuroimmunology at UCLA. In addition to his appointments in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, in the UCLA Department of Medicine and the Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Cole is also a member of the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center, the Norman Cousin Center, the UCLA AIDS Institute, and the UCLA Molecular Biology Institute. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research. In addition to his many affiliations with UCLA's leading research programs and national organizations, Dr. Cole also serves as director of the UCLA Social Genomics Core Laboratory and provides consulting support on social regulation of gene expression to the Institute of Medicine, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute on Aging, the Santa Fe Institute for Complex Systems, and the MacArthur Foundation, among others. His extensive body of work provides a new revolutionary understanding of the bidirectional interactions between our genome, our body, and the environment we live in. Welcome to the show, Steve. It's a pleasure talking to you again. We have had the, uh, the opportunities to talk both work-related at the university, but also in, in, in several interviews we've done together. So I, I can't wait with this um, conversation today. It's, it's always a topic I find absolutely fascinating. So let's, let's jump right into it. So your name has almost become synonymous with, with this field of social genomics. Uh, genomics. Would, would you, for, for people, so a lot of people have not heard that term. Would you just say in, in, a, in, in, in a couple of lay terms what this science does and what it what the goal is and what the methods are? Yeah, happy to do that. So first, it's great to be back in conversation with you. I always learn a lot when we talk, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. So social genomics really is a jailbreak, essentially, of a view of the human genome uh, that, you know, is, uh, I think, the one we're used to in school, that like the human genome is inside of us and it makes us, and that that's all you really need to know about. And what we're really trying to do is say, actually, there's everything we know about science suggests that that is not enough to explain how human lives and human bodies and human health come about, that the genome is not just inside us and pumping out information, but it's listening to the world around us. It's listening to the lives we lead. It's aware uh, fundamentally of when we're threatened, when we're secure when we're leading the lives that we want or, or uh, the, you know, pursuing the goals that, that you know, really mean something to us, there's a surprising amount of inbound information that hits the human genome and steers its biology. So it's not the case that the human genome is just a blueprint that makes the house of our body. It's more like uh, a menu that life can order from in terms of options about how a body can operate, how a body can grow, how a body can get sick, how a body can thrive. Um, so that's really what it's about, is a, a, this more transactional view of the human genome. Um, and with that comes this implication that we are 
you know, not isolated individual biological organisms, you know, preordained by our DNA, but in fact, we're, we're sort of a, uh, if you will, kind of a, a made up construct that is half shaped by our genetic endowment, the options that it creates, but then which of those options are realized, it depends on the, the lives we lead, and especially on the people around us and the way we, we lead our lives and the communities in which we do it. So it really gives us, I mean, sort of think about this in a slightly different way. It sort of gives us a, a bandwidth of, of, of how as humans we can function. So some is obviously programmed biologically, so we're not turning into an, an ape or another animal. Uh, so th there's clearly boundaries of what, what can change. But then there's this dimension that, you know, that you've been studying, which is this interactional dimension that, that re receives information from the outside world or from these different levels of the outside world and adapts to that in an optimal way is, is would you say that or a... or non-optimal ways i mean that's the key to remember is that it's not like this is guaranteed to be perfect but what it it raises is this this um implication that the way we lead our lives the lives that we lead you know impact the way our genomes work it's not like we're just born with this thing and it's going to do what it's going to do according to some pre-specified program the way i lead my life the places I go, the people I spend time with, the things that I do today will shape the way my DNA operates and, and creates my body going forward in the future. So it really introduces a tremendous amount of flexibility and 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 also, I mean, optimism if that mm -hmm. not 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 accepting, you know, what 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 genes you have and um but that 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 this this and we can talk about this later, this tremendous opportunity and techniques that people have used to actually shape this in a positive way. There's also something that that you mentioned in, in, in the same context. So this this idea that there's there's the, the genome inside of us and in our body and then there's the outside world. And we're really separate so these are really separate compartments um, that that operate. Um, and our sense of self gives us this illusion really that that we are separate. So this opens up a very different perspective of you know being being totally interconnected with 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 other networks that that play a role, social networks and and you know political networks and this connection with with the biological networks. Can can you expand on that a little bit? More? Yeah, happy to. So I think that is exactly right that the. The most significant implication of social genomics isn't the mechanics, the biology that allows the social world or the economic world or the political world to influence gene expression, but the way that that then adds up to a, a kind of a plasticity in, in who I am. So I think, you know, one of the, the challenges, the way we experience our bodies often is that they're like stable, you know, biological entities that live in the world, but as you said, are, are fundamentally separate from it. But at, the more we study individual bodies at the molecular level, the more we realize there's a tremendous amount of decision making going on about what's going to happen in a body. Are we going to, you know, run an immune response that's good against viruses or one that's good against bacteria, to take an example? Um, are we going to, this sounds like a, a crazy thing, but are we going to build an atherosclerotic plaque in our coronary artery? That is, to some extent, <clears throat> you know, sort of a decision a body makes. Um, and it has reasons for doing that. Some of these are programmed into the logic of our genome. But that logic is now intersecting with the lives that we actually lead. So you can think of us as having some pre-specified sets of of you know, programs that get activated in response to certain circumstances. And one of the programs that we bumped into, for example, is that, you know, the immune system is prepped to uh, take any situation where we feel threatened or even just insecure. You don't have to feel like something bad is definitely happening. You can just feel not terribly confident that everything's going to be okay. And the moment you feel that sense of uncertainty, um, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to ask for this your brainstem will say, okay, everything is not okay. We need to get ready to be hurt. This is a, uh, you can think of it as a defensive reflex that is built 
into the logic of human physiology as you know sort of structured by human genome and how it encodes brain cells and nerves and stuff like that but this this reflex isn't something that we have to decide when we feel threatened or uncertain automatically our brain stem is going to send these signals out through our fight or flight stress nerves into the rest of our bodies and every tissue in our body is going to change its behavior uh, as a as a consequence of that so when this you know when these these senses of threat or uncertainty uh, register in our our you know sort of psyches that information then becomes essentially sort of the release of neurotransmitters in various distant sites within our body and each tissue is set up to respond to that signal in certain ways as as has been you know optimal or adaptive as you described it over the course of evolution but the problem is that we don't live in environments that are at all like the environments that we evolved in for the vast majority of our tens of thousands of years of of evolution as as you know sort of approximately modern humans we lived in small social groups that were generally fairly cohesive, had a strong sense of community, um, and, you know, were absolutely interdependent on one another. So the human kind of strategy for even just being a successful animal that survives, it turns out it is built on the assumption that we have this kind of, you know, sort of tight community around us, because, you know, individual humans, we're not that big, we're not that strong, we're, you know, we're not going to take down a, a saber-toothed tiger if it comes through the camp or, you know, eat the mastodon for, for lunch or something like that. Um, but a bunch of humans together can do these things. They can defend against, you know, much stronger or quicker predators. And they can, you know, sort of um, acquire, uh, you know, giant resources uh, to, you know, have a community thrive. So this this is one assumption this kind of baked into the human genome that we have others around us and that that creates a sense of safety and security and options for you know thriving and generativity so now in the modern world flash forward to when we're not living in you know bands of 60 to 80 hunter gatherers or something like that in a environment where there's you know some threats periodically but mostly you know there's like stuff to eat and you know places to to take shelter and you know the world was is kind of a an abiding place in a certain respect now uh we live in the modern world which in by ob every objective standard is much safer right i mean we we you know we, we've solved lots of problems related to you know starvation and exposure to various kind of you know sort of eco level threats to us but what's interesting is that we now live in an environment that's structured by all kinds of media. And, uh, you know, this environment, this cultural environment has, has figured out, oh, I can sell advertising much better if I keep people's eyeballs glued to this screen. And what keeps people's eyeballs glued to the screen? A pervasive sense of threat from essentially other human beings or sometimes asteroids or nuclear mm -hmm. meltdowns or stuff like that. But all day long now, my brain is getting little sips of threat and insecurity. And what that adds up to in the context of this body that's evolved with this defensive reflex in it is all day, every day that I'm getting these little pings of threat or uncertainty, my body is firing off these defensive reflexes into my tissue that leads my immune system to say, whoa, 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 pivot away from fighting viruses because that's what we do when we're in a big crowd with other people and switch towards fighting bacteria, switch towards inflammation. Why? Because historically, when we got injured, we needed to deal with the wound that results from that. We needed to flow some inflammatory cells in there, stop the bleeding, you know, kill the bacteria that might have <laughs> colonized the wound and start rebuilding that damaged tissue. So there's this connection between feeling threatened or insecure and what my immune system is doing that involves pivoting away from kind of the baseline default mode of existence with lots of other people and the viruses that come along with that and switching over at least momentarily to this state of you know robust inflammatory biology to deal with wounding injuries the problem is you know our reflex this this kind of program that gets activated by threat 
that made sense in a world where threat happened 1% of the time, or maybe 5% of the time, but not every single day for, you know, all my waking hours. And so this is one example of this, this kind of mismatch between the world we now live in and the machine that we actually have inherited. And so now that this world is flowing in my eyes and ears and making me feel, you know, threatened, like, oh, those people are crazy. And, and, you know, what will happen to this world all the time? You know, our bodies are now getting this flow of inflammatory biology very consistently that they only got in periodic little sips when things were really bad, you know, sort of 10,000 years ago. So that's an example of how these, these programs are optimal uh, over the course of our history as a species, but there's no guarantee that they're optimal or adaptive in the world that we made for ourselves these days. Which is rapidly changing. It's not that there's a slow, you know, adaptation to a new lifestyle. I mean, it's it's dramatic. And if you just look at the last five years, you know, the the kind of things who have gone from from a a worldwide pandemic to serious discussions about uh, nuclear threat to you know, it, it's this has never happened in my lifetime. You know that there's so many different things are going on. That climate change, obviously, you know, um, those people that think about that are constantly when they wake up in the morning you know they they think about that um yeah i i mean I, i've thought about this from a different angle but i i think it converges on the same on on a very similar idea that our stress response systems have been optimized in evolution to deal with these acute life-threatening stresses like uh you know the, the the famous story about being chased by a tiger or um something that can be turned on immediately and turned off quickly when that threat is gone. And it saved, you know, humans as a species over and over, probably hundreds of thousands of times. Um, but today, you know, the, the the chronic engagement of the of the stress response is something that has the opposite effect. I mean, it it's 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 resulting in a in a in a, in, a, in a state of chronic immune system activation. Uh, also affects our, I mean, so many components, the diet and the, you know, the, the, the microbiome, everything is pushed towards this chronic immune system activation. And I mean, as a scientist, I always hate to have this sort of unifying, you know, string theory of diseases, but, <laughs> but it really seems like, you know, the, the, the current epidemic of chronic diseases, which seemingly are unrelated, all come down to this chronic inappropriate immune activation which, which is yeah that was really an interesting development wasn't it uh so for for those of you who are not you know sort of like physicians or health biologists around the early 2000s as we got better at molecular biology and cell biology and we could you know then understand diseases like atherosclerotic plaques or neurodegenerative diseases like alzheimer's or metastatic cancers we we develop molecular biology and were able to, you know, sort of take those things apart and understand what are the gears and pulleys that actually operate to make a disease. And one of the things that we discovered that was really interesting is that lots of different diseases involved the same ingredients. These ingredients were operating in different environments, but some of these ingredients were things like inflammatory biology, where immune cells were coming into tissues and executing these kinds of antimicrobial responses and wound healing responses in ways that damage the local tissue. And in one context, like your coronary artery, that might create a, an atherosclerotic plaque and, and, you know, it might eventually block blood flow to your, your coronary artery and it would, you know, run out of oxygen and have a heart attack. But that same cell operating that same inflammatory program when it instead migrated into the environment of a growing tumor would help that tumor grow and metastasize. Mm -hmm. And the same cells, when they got into the brain, would lead to neurodegeneration. So we in, you know, sort of, you, if you will, health biology started to realize that lots of these, these diseases that seem very different were really shared some, some core common elements. They, they had their differences in their locations, but some culprits were interacting recurrently almost a, you know as a theme across these different types of diseases and these were interestingly all the diseases that have shown 
general trends toward increasing prevalence over time. So, you know, once upon a time, we mostly died of infectious diseases, you know, early in life or in midlife. Uh, it was rare to live to, you know, 50 or 60 or 70 years old. But um, what's changed as we've gotten better at dealing with infectious diseases through our culture, we've defeated lots of pathogens or at least reduced their deadliness with things like, you know, good sanitation, you know, basic, you know, sort of healthcare systems, um, good nutrition to keep our immune systems running, things like vaccines. These are all things that have dramatically reduced the rate at which we die of infections. And what that means then is that we age longer than essentially we had originally evolved to. And so these things like this, this threat reflex that produces inflammation that, you know, it didn't used to matter a whole heck of a lot if we had an atherosclerotic plaque, if we were just going to die at 30 or 50 anyway, right? I mean, we wouldn't probably live to the point where we were going to have a big heart attack. But now all of that stuff is on the table. And now we live in a world where, as you know, you just said, Emran, like this stress is there every day. It's not as intense as the threat that comes from the saber-toothed tiger running through the camp. But what our bodies aren't, you know, sort of evolved to deal with is the chronicity, the consistency. So you can think of it as a low grade drizzle day in and day out for decades in your body. So it's not a huge rainstorm that, you know, comes and then passes within a day or two. Um, it is this constant low grade drizzle of, you know, sort of threat biology that then helps build these disease processes over time. And so, yeah, that's, that's the, um, the, the sort of the surprising interconnectedness of many different types of disease. But I think, you know, what that also led us to start thinking about is how other risk factors for these diseases played through this. And this is really a lot of the, the impetus to social genomics was taking these genomics based tools that were, we were using to understand disease and then applying them to the other things we knew about from epidemiology about the risk factors for these diseases. So we knew that heart attacks didn't just involve inflammation, but they also involved, you know, people that had chronically high levels of stress, uh, people that had uh, high body mass index, um, you know, people who uh, didn't get much exercise. We knew from epidemiology that all of these were risk factors as well. And so that led us to ask questions like, hey, you know, one of the things that's a risk factor for heart attacks is just living in poverty. People who don't have a lot of economic resources, people that don't have uh, stable, abiding, you know, social communities that they live within, they are also at elevated risk for heart attacks. And so that was kind of, uh, that was the provocation for social genomics really was understanding, okay, if living in poverty or, uh, you know, not being part of a, you know, sort of a safe abiding community, if those are also driving heart attacks, that must have a biology. We knew the heart attacks now are, you know, this atherosclerotic plaque and these monocytes and inflammatory cells getting in there. So how is it that a social risk factor would affect that kind of biological machinery of this disease? So that's really how we got started in all of this, is trying to understand social environmental risk factors that we knew were present from epidemiology, but we didn't know how they impacted in the body in ways that would create these diseases. So that was really kind of the first decade of social genomics is you can think of it as the dark side of, you know, sort of the biology of, of the human genome. But after about a decade of, you know, sort of running through the roster of all the social environmental risk factors that we knew about things like poverty or social isolation or disconnection or uh, unstable communities and, you know, mapping out, okay, all of these actually, they have very similar effects. The brain treats the individual as under threat, fires off these defensive threat reflexes, and you get more inflammation, and that inflammation fuels all of these different diseases. But at some point, the, as that story started to solidify, we started to ask the next obvious question, which is, this is not great, right? I mean, having heart attacks, not good. Having you know autoimmune diseases, not, not to be desired. How can we stop this? And another question, another version of that question is really, 
you know, what is the kind of life I can lead that will reduce this kind of threat related biology and help my genome operate in a way that doesn't build metastatic cancers and atherosclerotic plaques and neurodegenerative diseases. So we started looking at resilience factors at, at you know, what are the things that people can do even when they're living in threatening or adverse environments um, to protect against these kinds of disease processes. And the interesting thing about the molecular biology is that we can see this stuff at work decades before people actually get diagnosed with a heart attack. So we can see your lifestyle operating in your body. We can see the molecular fingerprints of feeling threatened or uncertain today, even in young people, long before the body has had a chance to build that atherosclerotic plaque or the, the metastatic cancer or the, the Alzheimer's disease. So that created an interesting kind of biomarker that we could use to ask what, you know, when is that not happening? And so we started sorting through um, studies of positive factors, things like social support or um, happiness and well-being or, um, you know, sort of meditative practices and um, exercise and, you know, the things that we knew, again, from epidemiology that, you know, should at least in, in you know, to some extent protect us against these kinds of adverse biologies. And there, uh, actually, that's in some sense the, the most surprising set of results we found, um, because it, it, many of the things that kind of our culture had, you know, intuited might be protective were they, actually when we looked at the molecular biology, you know, things like laughter and happiness and stuff like, like that didn't seem to correlate very much with difference in these <laughs> biology. But there were some aspects of well-being that did correlate with more favorable molecular profiles. And the two ones that really shined through were one, living in a tight sense of community with others, this, this sense of being socially integrated and especially being optimistic about the social world around you, about the people around you, feeling a sense of connection to other humans, especially other humans, you know, physically in your world, in your, your you know, your local community, feeling a sense of trust um, and a sense of uh, almost um, optimism about how people are. That turned out to correlate with, you know, quite favorable gene expression profiles that ended up when we went back and double checked this in epidemiology, actually, you know, epidemiologists had never really asked much about that question, but when they started doing that, they found, yeah, lo and behold, you know, this sense of community and faith in other human beings is associated with much lower rates of, uh, you know, many serious diseases, heart attacks, cancers, that kind of thing. So that was one interesting realization is the power of social connection or embeddedness. The other thing that shone through was uh, an interesting distinction in the world of happiness. So I think most of us, especially in, in Western cultural settings, think of happiness as sort of, you know, again, laughter and euphoria and, uh, you know, sort of the, the if, if you will, um, you know, sort of the kind of happiness that comes from consuming if you will, you know, positive experiences, right? Like eating a tasty dinner, um, you know, sort of like watching a funny movie. So you can think of this almost in, in philosophical terms as, you know, Epicurus's recipe for the good life, right? His idea about the good life was like, you just sum up a lot of good moments and that what's, that's what makes a good life. Mm -hmm. So happiness researchers had been focusing on this quite a lot um, recently. But there's always been this other strand of happiness research um, that is actually more historically kind of associated with the, the thinking of Aristotle. Um, and that is really this notion that the high, deepest form of happiness comes not from taking care of yourself and making yourself happy, but from doing good stuff for other people, from pursuing some kind of cause or purpose greater than your own immediate self gratification. And that um, I think is is sort of, uh, you know, these days the happiness theorists call that eudaimonic well-being. And what we discovered when we were looking at biology was, wow, eudaimonic well-being has great correlates in the molecular world. People who were, you know, sort of pursuing some kind of big mission in their life, even if it was hard on a daily basis, 
their RNA profiles, their molecular well-being indices, they looked great uh, even when they were saying this is this is hard and stressful stuff. And I think a great example of this is raising kids. Nobody says raising kids is a, a walk in the park, right? It is. It takes a lot of energy and time. It's tremendously frustrating. But over and over, we find that people who raise kids have a tremendous sense of purpose and meaning in their life. They really know what they're doing and why, because a lot of it centers around taking care of their family and particularly their, their children. So they tend to look really, really good on this kind of biology, even though life on a daily basis is hard. They, they often say, you know, like uh, when you're a parent, you know, the days are long and the years are short. It, it, on a daily basis, you know, it's, it's really stressful and tough. But the years go by really quickly because it is such a compelling way to live, such a, a, an amazing mission to be involved in. And so that's one example of this broader theme, that people that are engaged in these big missions in life, their biology looked great, even when they lived in very challenging situations. So those are two of the insights that came from being able to look at these molecular signatures of well-being before they you know, materialized as a heart attack or a mm. cancer or a, a neurodegenerative disease. When you think about it, so the, the, some of the, the most human activities are are raising kids and families and optimizing coherence in, in social groups. So it almost seems like evolution has kind of rewarded those activities with, you know, providing the, the healthiest molecular um um you know image to that to to those activities which which are essential for human survival would you say that that's that's a yeah good... that i would i would agree um i think one of the you know reward is like a tricky word right so we think of rewards as like you know you do something good and someone gives you an m m right i mean it's like this idea that that um you know uh, the genome is is you know so, sort of monitoring our moral you know caliber or something like that and and you know giving us little droplets of health as a result that you know i'm not so sure just because you know immune cells they don't have brains right the the transcription factors that turn on and turn off these genes they don't have a lot of information about the moral valor of how we're spending our days so this led to a really interesting you know, sort of pursuit over the last maybe five to, to 10 years where we we're trying to figure out who knows whether you're living a good life, right? Clearly your leukocyte is not, you know, sort of like sitting there, you know, like Santa Claus determining whether you've been a good person this year. It turns out that who knows uh, whether you're giving, uh, you know, leading the life you should is, is mostly your brain. So this led us to a lot of brain neuroscience that, um, you know, is very similar to the, the work that, that you guys do in kind of mind-body connections in the gut. And that really highlighted the neurobiology of happiness and the fact that, in fact, there's at least two different versions of happiness in the human brain. Um, so the neuroscientists call these these kind of brain systems that mediate happiness, they call them reward systems. And historically, the reward system that had been studied because, you know, they were starting out in pigeons and rats and stuff like that was the one where, you know, if you give the pigeon an M&M, &M, you know, bing, that, that system turns on. So this is a reward system that when it gets what it wants, it gets happy. It, it you know, that's when those neurons start to fire is when you get what you want. So you can think of it as like a, an after the fact reward system. But as neuroscientists started to study, um, you know, sort of seeking and creating and feeding and caretaking, it turns out, they realized that there was another reward system in the brain that was most active. The neurons fired the most when you were seeking something that you believed would give you a reward once you got it. So this is a system that you can think of it as a positive motivation system or an aspiration system. This is the, the seeking, the hoping, the wanting system in the brain. And that, it turns out, sits in a different set of neurons than the liking section of your brain, the section of your brain that fires when you're feeling you know, happy because you got the M&Ms. So this seeking, hoping, wanting system is more associated 
with structures such as the, you know, broadly speaking, the ventral striatum. So things like the caudate putamen, and the nucleus accumbens, for those of you who are not into neuroscience, you, we're not going to test you after the, the podcast here. It's okay. You don't have to worry about those words. But what's helpful to realize is that there's at least two different types of happiness in the brain. One of them is the happiness that you get after consuming a positive event. The other one is the happiness that you get from pursuing something that you think is going to be good um, and really make your life better, make the world a better place. And they run in different sections of the brain. And what's interesting about the aspirational, forward-looking, kind of hoping, seeking, wanting system is it can exert some veto over threat. So we now believe that, in fact, it's not the case that people leading these highly eudaimonic pro-social lives of you know striving and aspiration it's not the case that the leukocyte is listening to eudaimonia neurotransmitters that leukocyte is just getting much less information that it is threatened than uh, a leukocyte from a person who is is you know feeling chronically insecure or even a person who's feeling chronically insecure and laughing all the time right i mean that those systems don't inhibit the threat system. What inhibits the threat system is the wanting system. So I think the best image of this is around, you know, it, it's it, it led us to really kind of think differently about how what the logic is or the evolutionary rationale is for mind-body connection. So the historical theory about what mind-body connections were doing is that they were there to defend the body against you know bad things against injury so the idea was that stress was there to protect your body um, that mind-body you know neuroscience was there to cause you to you know run away from dangerous things or fight dangerous things or that kind of thing but as we started theorizing more about what's going on in the brain we realized that the goal of this mind-body connection that was influencing systems like white blood cells and inflammation and antiviral responses and incidentally creating all these diseases, that this system actually probably wasn't there fundamentally to defend us. It's probably there fundamentally to defend what we care about. And in lots of times, what we care about, what is going on in our ventral striatum, and what is lighting up our nucleus incumbents, lots of times that is us. But sometimes there's stuff that we care about more than our own individual well-being. So the prototypical example is, you know, there's, it's very hard to account for parents running into burning buildings if you think that self-protection is the fundamental organizing principle of human biology. It's very easy to think about parents running into burning buildings to rescue their kids if you think about, you know, protecting what you care about, what you value as the fundamental organizing principle of human biology. So this really led us to reconstrue the, um, uh, you know, sort of the fundamental uh, driving force or organizing principles of mind-body connections. And so once you start to think of human biology as structured by our goals and our values and our aspirations, then it becomes actually much easier to account for the pattern of risk factors and the fact that people that are engaged in stuff that they really care about, they're going to keep doing that even if they personally are threatened because they feel like that is more important in many cases even than their own individual well-being or survival. This is how you can get people sacrificing their lives for, for their country. This is how you can get parents sacrificing their, their physical comfort and well-being for the survival of their children. And this is how you can get quite a lot of the other things that are going on in the world that don't make sense from this self-protection standpoint, because fundamentally it looks like our biology, our brains, and our genomes aren't there to just prolong our own lives. They're there to contribute to the stream of healthy humanity in the long run. And that was quite a, a kind of a pivot away from this individually focused view of what's going on in human biology and toward this more synthetic view that we're really individual, individuals, humans are like cells in a body and the body of humanity is what we're really there to help 
you know, promote in terms of surviving and thriving and growth and generativity. So it's a very different outlook than we typically tend to have, especially in Western cultural systems. Um, but, you know, certainly underscores the fundamental connectedness of humans and, and you know, most other organisms as well. Uh, in terms of, you know, it, it it's hard to make sense of how the human genome works without thinking of humans as cells in a bigger body of humanity, as members of a community, and as, again, you know, contributors to the ongoing stream of human health. And that's really what the human genome there is, is you know, doing, is it is it is structuring that stream of successful humanity. It's not so much about, can I live to 100? It's can I, you know, help keep humanity healthy and thriving and vibrant seems to be the fundamental organizing principle. Yeah, this is fascinating. I mean, I could, you know, I could listen to you for for hours on on on, on these topics, but sort of coming back to to a topic we we started talking in the beginning. That that we're faced with this, you know, chronic disease epidemic in in primarily in the Western world, but also. <clears throat> with export of our lifestyles and and you know transmission of information and and the social media to every part of the world i mean you could take take two attitudes one is this doom and gloom attitude that you know uh, the world is has, is taking a course and it's going to go downhill um for multiple reasons you know and some brains organize reality into this i mean i i'm I'm vulnerable to that kind of thinking as well. You know, we've had climate change and wars and corrupt politicians and fractions, uh, fractionation of consensus in societies and all, like all these things. Um, so one thing is going down and you know, having this gloom and doom um, viewpoint. And then there's the other one that, you know, that you are alluding to. I mean, there are ways that we can counteract this. and um, But it's ways that we're not really pursuing on a on a majority basis i mean this like what you're talking about probably i'm i'm not sure how many people have ever heard this or have ever thought about this i mean some some practice it you know like uh i mean you know including religious people and uh so some some practice those principles um but which which areas which practical areas do you, from from research studies now would you say people can implement you know, besides sort of having a different global view on what's happiness and but what what practical measures can people take to uh, to counteract um, you know as as a physician, I would say a top priority would be this chronic uh, non-infectious disease epidemic. I mean, how what what can ordinary people do to counteract this? Well, excellent question, and I got some answers for you. So first, you alluded to one that is really powerful and underappreciated, and that is the, the tremendous power of faith and religion to help mend the fraying social fabric to create communities of shared value and, um, you know, sort of a sense of confidence in your fellow human being and, a, a, you know, sort of communities that, that organize around values that are fundamentally pro-social. That doesn't mean, you know, religion doesn't have a dark side sometimes, but religion used to be, if you will, you know, you know what, it, it's it's useful to have this idea of, you know, humanity as, you know, originally we were villagers around a river. There was like a sustaining central core to most, you know, villages. And, you know, that is the role that faith and religion played in many lives throughout the vast majority of our history. And in fact, this is this is in probably one of the most underappreciated threats that we now confront, which is the, the loss of religion as a central organizing theme. Now there's there's reasons for that, right, that we can get into, but you know, having to do with you know cultural and political processes where you know you you, you don't want to necessarily um, make that the sole solution. But Religion spontaneously, to the extent that it's available in a person's life, spontaneously solves a lot of these these problems. So that's that's one area where you, you, you there's a natural response for this. There are other domains 
Um, you know, clearly there are practices that were once part of religions and have been exported from religions because they are so useful. So meditation is a perfect example, right? Meditation was invented by monks so that they could ponder moral philosophy. We now use it as a anxiety reducing agent, but the monks, you know, they're like, what, what, are, you, what are you doing? You're, you're like, you know, clearing your mind and then you're doing nothing with it. You know, that, that seems ridiculous, right? Their, their idea was like the reason to clear your mind is so that you could ponder what is right in the world and how to make things more right or, you know, what kinds of things you should do to, to make the world a better place. But be that as it may, meditation still works pretty well for at least clearing your mind of the threatening stuff and reconnecting with the present in the here and now, this, this whole notion of mindfulness, this idea, let's, let's don't think about all this other stuff. Let it go through your consciousness and then reconnect with the here and now and what is present and who is around you and what's really there material in your world. So that process of just centering personal local reality is tremendously powerful. And I think that um, we see a strong reaction, particularly in advanced Western industrialized societies towards the loss of the the psychological and social well-being that used to to come from you know communal religious experiences and the replacement of that with you know sort of these individual practices that have that same characteristic of bringing attention back to the here and now and thinking about you know how i want to spend my time which is a, a code for what is important what is valuable what do you aspire to so we often in the West feel very uncomfortable talking about values and aspirations because we feel like those are very private things and people shouldn't talk to, about them. But again, you know, if you were to find one, you know, magic, you know, sort of ingredient that we could drop into people's lives that would most significantly enhance their health, it turns out that's what it would be having a strong sense of purpose and meaning and sort of connection to the community around you that can help advance that purpose. So, we, you know, in science, there's lots of protocols for getting people reconnected to purpose or pro-social engagement. They range from things like random acts of kindness protocols, which sound goofy, but in, if, you know, surprisingly, over and over and over again, we do studies on these, you know, sort of molecular readouts and people who are randomly assigned to do kind acts for other human beings on a semi-regular basis, um, you know, their biology all those biomarkers click back in a very favorable direction. So it's a pretty reliable result. People who, so a, a great example of this kind of thing is a, you know, studies where people are assigned to help particularly needy individuals. So let's say you have, you know, sort of uh, old grandmas living in South Central LA who, you know, watch Judge Judy all day long. If you can get them out of their house, get their clothes on, you know, get them into the local schools, to serve as teachers aides to help particularly the you know maybe two or three kids per class who really come from the most challenging backgrounds their biology looks great and you know they they show over just a few months of this kind of classroom teaching aid role very positive changes in antiviral biology reductions in inflammatory biology um, of exactly the sort that you would expect if engaging in some kind of generative purpose-driven work beyond your own immediate self-gratification. These grandmas, they could have gone to the mall and watched a movie, right? But if they're in the schools, that's not easier on a daily basis, right? I mean, you know, the schools are complicated, challenging environments. The kids are, it's always, you know, even under the best of circumstances, hard helping kids learn. Um, so it's not like every moment is euphoria, but you know, these grandmas, they know that this matters. They know these kids need them. They know these kids appreciate them. And it is very powerful when these kids say that directly to them. So this, this is, you know, the secret sauce of human existence. This is why we have thrived and survived as a species is because we are very, very socially rewarded. This idea that other people need me and appreciate me and so I'm going to, first, my, my ventral striatum strongly rewards me in situations like that. And it, it leads me to work even harder to, you know, engender the health and appreciation of, of others around me. 
So uh, at the same time, it says to my threat response system, you, you don't have to be worried. You don't have to be anxious because this is the right thing to do. This is what matters. You're doing what matters. Okay. It's hard work, but you're pursuing what really matters in this world. And that's the right thing for you to do. And so that's the interesting thing that we've learned is like there is a, an evaluative, essentially a moral judgment section of the brain. And one of its consequences is to say, you don't need to worry. You don't need to feel threatened. You are doing the right thing. You're doing what matters. And that's what seems to veto this threat biology that otherwise gets into the body and says, oh, am I okay? You know, is everything going to be all right? Am I going to get hurt? That kind of stuff. So th this idea of dedicating yourself to some kind of generative activity, some kind of pro-social activity, that's another big opportunity. It doesn't have to be structured around religion, but it does have to be structured, it looks like, around value and aspiration and feeling like this is important and noble and right and virtuous. Um, and then, you, you know, there are ways you can you can make an end run around these threat systems. And there's sometimes when that's the, the, the right thing to do. So we know, for example, that we can drug these systems, right? There are heart attack medications that, you know, our parents got when they, they had high blood pressure or a heart attack. Um, beta blockers, as long as these beta blockers block beta-2 adrenergic receptors, which is like one of the molecules involved in delivering this fight or flight signaling into the body, we often use these when people get hit with a threat that you just can't think your way out of. So a prototypical example is like, I just got diagnosed with cancer. I'm going into surgery next week. You know, is there anything I can do to prevent that stress biology from interacting with my cancer to help it metastasize more effectively? Surgery, it's important to do, but man, when you get in there and start cutting stuff up, that's a big recipe for, you know, cancer cells, a few of them to escape from the primary tumor and seed out and metastasize elsewhere in the body. So one great set of, you know, there's now several studies looking at, can we give people these beta blocker drugs just for that week before surgery and then for another week or two after surgery and see any reduction in this threat related biological stuff in the tumor. So when that surgeon actually pulls the tumor out, they've already been on the beta blocker for a week and we can ask, did the beta blocker change, you know, the tumor in any way that makes it look like it's less aggressive? And the answer is yes. So, um, you know, we still need to scale these things up to, you know, studies of tens of thousands of people so we can make sure they actually impact survival and disease recurrence and stuff like that, the hardcore clinical outcomes. But at the molecular biomarker level, blocking this stress biology during highly threatening circumstances is a viable way to go. We don't want to par park people on beta blockers the rest of their lives. There's downsides to that for sure. But it's impossible to tell somebody who's just been diagnosed with cancer don't stress, it's just going to make it worse, right? Meditate a lot to make your stress go away. That's not going to happen, right? You need to do the work of adapting to this new scary reality. But we don't need that threat biology going into your body and fueling more, you know, aggressive cancer biology. So that's another example of the kind of stuff we can do. So there's, I would say, at least three big options these days. One is, you know, drugs used under very, you know, selective circumstances to literally intercept this stress biology in the body. There's wellness practices um, that, you know, essentially can reduce the amount of threat, increase the amount, uh, at least reduce the amount of threat. Ideally, you know, in the traditional form, uh, open up some space in your psyche so that you can re-engage with more positive values and aspirations. And then this third domain of pro-social behavior. So those are the the kind of the go-to options that we have at this point. So do you think, um, I mean, the way you see it is, are these principles, I mean, they seem to be relatively simple and, and, and inexpensive interventions compared to, you know, what modern medicine does to, to, to reduce or stabilize uh, mortality. I mean, I often think about this, you know, modern medicine is obviously fantastic in, in reducing mortality, but morbidity is, has not really decreased. It's it's increasing for most of those problems we've been talking about earlier. <clears throat> but do you think there's optimism to believe that, you know, modern Western medicine is incorporating some of these ideas and, and principles into 
not not a, as a sort of a marginal thing, but really as a core principle that th this is important to decrease our healthcare expenditures, which keep increasing constantly, and um, keep keep people healthy, not just keep them from dying. Yeah, it's happening, um, but slowly. I mean, we you know we we live in in the kind of the biomedical research enterprise. We're both very familiar with how medicine operates on a clinical level, and um, I would say that uh, evolution in these environments um, is driven by two things. One of them is re replacement, basically, like as younger physicians who are more aware of and appreciate more directly these kinds of, uh, you know, connections, uh, so, uh, often as a function of their training or their personal experiences, as they become a more, you know, as they, they age into the system and replace the generations that were trained under the, the, you know, pathogen model, we call it, which is like health is driven by, you know, machine, body machines not working right or microbes, you know, insulting them or something like that. So they, they really were not trained to attend to or even respect the role of psychological or social or cultural processes. Um, so there were, there were literally generations of physicians that were told that stuff is not important. That's not our domain. That's not what drugs operate on. That's not what surgery can affect. But I think starting in the 1970s, there was, you know, the, the, the first biological appreciation that there were connections there and evolving through the early 2000s, it became increasingly evident in epidemiology that social factors mattered. And so there's a whole generation of physicians trained in the last couple of decades who are now much more familiar with somehow that stuff must matter because the numbers are, you know, incorrigible. I mean, that, you know, poverty, highly associated with lots of diseases, um, you know, favorable life circumstances associated with much less disease burden. And so that that is there now as a mindset. What we don't have in the current business model of medicine is great options for getting people to do some of these things. But the other, so so part of the driver for how medicine operates is just the mindset of the, the medical practitioners, the people that do that work. And so that is changing slowly over time um, in, in a favorable direction. There is a, a second driver, which is for lack of a, of a more delicate term, patient demand. Patients have had it with, you know, there's a drug for everything. Patients really want to be able to change their lives in ways that will reduce the risk of disease. That's not every patient. Some patients are just, doc, give me the, the pill. I want to go back to my stressful yeah. life. But the general public has really appreciated the same point that these physicians in training in the last couple of generations have appreciated as well as this stuff matters. And interestingly, um, that has accelerated in just the last five to 10 years, I think in part because the digital world has stressed people out so much. So as we all know, there's an epidemic of stress <laughs> and loneliness and isolation and mistrust in your fellow human beings. It's driven in no small part by the way, particularly social media algorithms, you know, drive provocative content mm -hmm. to people, uh, which keeps them engaged with the social media platforms, but also, so it's, it's good for them economically, but it also, you know, the way it does that is by leaving people threatening and anxious and, and threatened, th you know, th both threatening and threatened, uh, and anxious and worried and all of this, you know, catastrophizing that doesn't really add up to solving these problems. So that, that, you know, the arrival of the appreciation in the general public's mind about mind-body medicine drove a lot of <laughs> medical care to include what they called complementary and alternative medicine clinics. And that, for particularly wise clinicians like yourself, they started incorporating that fundamentally into the mainstream biomedical practice. That's still not the norm, but I believe it, it will increasingly be the norm just simply because patients really want it. Um, so that's going to drive it as well. And then there's, there are some, you know, as the economics of healthcare changes from pay for service to pay for outcomes and, you know, pay for health maintenance for, you know, at, at the organizations where the revenue flows towards protecting health 
are increasingly appreciating, you know, the value of behavioral and psychological and social factors and really centralizing them um, to some extent in their care plans, but even more so in their media plans. So the, you know, there's health maintenance organizations that have structured their entire marketing campaign around things like thriving and community and, you know, sort of, uh, you could think of them in, in the sense that these more, you know, older conservative biomedical model physicians would say is like, that's, this is not medicine at all. This is, you know, barely health or healthcare. And yet, you know, this is what creates the kind of the aspirational theme for, for how some of these organiz organizations operate. So I think that is going to become a more central theme in the identity, the self-identity of all healthcare providers, both at the individual level and at the organizational level. So I do think that there are strands operating together, but uh, it's, it, it, it's driven in large part by patient demand uh, and the fact that patients respond to marketing campaigns that talk about thriving and whole person well-being and whole person health and that kind of thing. So we're to some extent getting dragged along by the marketplace really more than vice versa. Yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, we could continue on this. I mean, there's still many topics that we didn't cover in our conversation, but I think this this is a good point um, ending this conversation on a positive note. So there are changes. I, I, I would have to say I've experienced that myself you know, having had some of these ideas like 25 years ago. Right. And, uh, you were there before it was popular, huh? <laughs> yeah. So without any support for the from, from the institution and, um, you know, it was considered really a fringe thing. Um, the field that, you know, that you have been closely associated with is psychoneuroimmunology was always considered something obscure that is not part of mainstream medicine. Uh, obscure I, at best, absurd at worst, right? So... Yeah, so I mean, if I look at the situation today, even at a you know conservative institution like UCLA, it, things have changed significantly. You know, and as you said, it's driven by a new generation of physicians. Um, even though they are trained in a very rigorous way, you know, they with burnout and I mean, so the most unhealthy way that we we, we train our healers, uh, many of them, uh, you know have realized and are practicing or moving into areas that is this new kind of seeing the you know the body and uh this integrated view of seeing health and 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 and, and disease so um yeah i mean i'm looking forward in the future to have more of those conversations and um i always feel i would say empowered listening to you because it's just so convincing to uh, the, the way you can present some of these these facts that I know uh, the majority of people, even those that are more into wellness now, are not really that familiar with, you know, like the, the kind of stuff that you're doing or have been doing for decades now is something that um, seems to provide, I mean, how should I say this? Um, technically, it's very difficult, you know, it's <laughs> to understand all the stuff that you measure and how you measure it, difficult, but the the outcome and the recommendations are actually very straightforward and simple and and actionable you know which is the the most important thing so i i think for me it's always a you know a really uplifting moment to discuss um, these these topics with you and hope we'll continue doing this in the future so thanks again steve for for taking the time to um you know to talk to me about this again and um yeah, looking uh, looking forward to 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 see how medicine will continue to change in our lifetimes. Uh, probably we haven't seen the end yet of that evolution. No, I think you're right, and it is always a delight to talk with you about this. So I look forward to our next chat.